Uh, our next speaker is uh, Brad Jones, a uh, senior sales engineer from Delania. Um, Brad has over 20 years of uh, experience in corporate IT, servers, routers, operations, QA, project management, and also a programmer analyst. So very broad, comprehensive experience. And Brad has worked in the financial market data and the higher education verticals and a lot of industry experience as well. And uh, Brad will talk about privileged access management beyond vaulting. I work currently uh, with Delinea, and we're a privileged access management uh, solution. And really, whenever you look at it, um, you've got the PIM, which is the privileged identity management over here, and the PAM, which is privileged access management. Privileged identity management usually relies upon someone logging in with the same credential and then using that same credential in different places uh, sort of across the network. Um, and, and it works really, really well in a homogeneous environment. Uh, but once you get to a more heterogeneous environment, uh, it can be very difficult to use that one identity. And instead is what we wind up doing is brokering privileged identities for people. So that's where PAM differs from PIM um, in some important aspects. Uh, one of the nice things about PAM is it's able to really control servers, routers, different things sort of all across the network. Um, I, uh, our company is currently called Delinea. We recently um, had a name change. Uh, you may know us by our maiden name, which is Thycotic Centrify. I am from the Thycotic side of the house. Uh, we have a well-known product called Secret Server and then a number of other products. Uh, we have uh, merged together with Centrify, who has a very famous uh, AD bridging product for Unix called Server Suite. And it's what you'll see is the way that we're able to bring both sides uh, of the company together to, to create a, a really broad privileged access management solution. And I wanted to talk today a little bit about, um, a little bit about vaulting, but really sort of beyond vaulting. Uh, sort of what do you do once you have your 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 basic use cases uh, covered, which is sort of the vaulting and the and the uh, account rotation. So um, one nice thing about Pam is that it fits in very nicely in a security ecosystem. So um, Pam plays very nicely with different IAM solutions as well. Uh, Pam is a small part of your identity. Uh, and access management project at the end of the day. Uh, but it's a very important part uh, because it really covers those, the, those really high risk credentials, uh, no matter where they sit. There's not, not much point spending half a million dollars for a firewall and then leaving the default password on it, right? So the, a, a lot of what, what we're going to deal with is finding privileged accounts, bringing them in to our system, controlling the access to them, being able to rotate the passwords on them and uh, allowing people to access them, whether it's via an SSH session or an RDP session. Um, and as what you'll see here is that the more you automate away, the more savings you're gonna get. So the, the more you, you actually go forward beyond that just simple vaulting and you set up the automation, the more successful you're going to be with your PAM product. And the other bit is that just in time bit, the exact sort of PIM thing that, that, that uh, Brian was talking about earlier. And that is eliminating standing privileges, making people request standing uh, request privileges, um, and probably proving who they are before they're allowed to do that. PAM's changed a lot um, in the past few years. Um, originally, it was sort of the thought was, okay, I have a domain admin credential. I'm gonna vault that one. Um, I'm going to use a lesser privileged account, so, you know, the, the least privileged approach. And I'm going to use that in order to get access to my more privileged account. But as what we've seen is we've really seen uh, PAM take off uh, the, the number of privileged accounts and what's considered a privileged account has really, really changed uh, in enterprises in the past, you know, five, ten years. We have a lot more non-human entity entities, and people have started to pay much more attention to the non-human entities. What we also see is that, is that developers can often have a lot of privilege. Uh, and, and part of what we need to do is rein in some of that privilege, but still allow them to do their work. 
So we need to make it seamless for them to be able to do their work. Um, but we do need to, to put controls. You know, I, I don't log in with my domain admin credential and open my, uh, my email anymore. That would be uh, nonsense uh, the way that I used to do, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the world's changed, and, and I think everyone realizes that, and everyone is, is moving beyond that. One of the other identities up at the top that you'll see is business users. So before, the domain admin users, very important, let's vault those credentials. But then people started saying, well, hold on, I've got business users who aren't domain admins that have important credentials. I have a Twitter account, and that Twitter account is a corporate account. And it's very important. If someone posts the wrong thing to that Twitter account, my company is going to be in very, very big trouble. So we want to bring in those business users, maybe those people from the marketing department, all those people with their privileged accounts as well. We want to store all that in one system so that we're able to go in and, and, and really uh, address a lot of those use cases, whether they are you know, the high up domain admin or whether they're the the marketing person who needs to log into a SaaS application. Then the other big thing that we're seeing is remote workers. How do we make it secure for remote workers who are never on my network? You know, my laptop probably hasn't been on the VPN for two years now. Most of my applications are SaaS applications. I don't need to join the VPN to do my work. You know, how do we rotate the local admin password on my, on my endpoint? And we do that with a product we call Privilege Manager. You install an agent on the endpoint, the agent's able to then go and, and rotate that password um, on a schedule, whether or not that machine is on my corporate network or not. The other big thing you'll see down here is, is this focus on different things being accessed. So you've got different roles, different identities, accessing different kinds of systems whether they're, you know, data systems or devices, or a lot of what we've been doing lately is cloud access. You know, um, people don't wanna be just in one cloud. People wanna be cloud agnostic. They wanna have um, AWS, they wanna have Azure, they wanna have Google Cloud. How can I have one system that's able to then go uh, and vault all those credentials, rotate them as necessary and control and monitor who accesses them? And that's what we do, right? So that's where a third party system that sits outside of a single cloud provider is able to put all that into one system and really control the access to, to different places. Then the bigger one we've got right now is code, right? So how do I get hard coded credentials out of my code and fetch them at runtime? So one of the big things that, that I'm seeing personally is ephemeral credentials, right? Those short TTL credentials from all the different cloud providers. How do I go and grab those from one place, log uh, when they were retrieved, uh, give them securely to, to, uh, to a program, let the program do its work, and then verify that they've been torn down. The other big thing is a CICD pipeline tools, right? So your Kubernetes, your Terraform, your... Ansible, right? How do we have plugins to those that can go and retrieve credentials from an API? Um, and that's that's sort of the whole challenge, right? Is that we're getting different identities accessing different kinds of data, and we want to secure all that sort of in one place. Uh, of course, uh, two big buzzwords: least privilege and zero trust. Right? The idea behind least privilege uh, can mean a couple things, right? It could mean, hey, I'm gonna vault this domain admin credential, the user's gonna come in with their workstation credential, get access to the domain admin credential, um, and that's privileged access. So that's, um, that's really uh, the privileged access and session management side of the house. The other side of the house is just as important, um, and that is, the, uh, that is the privileged elevation side of the house. So least privilege could mean on my laptop, I'm not allowed to install anything I want, but there's gonna be an agent monitoring me. And whenever I try to install something that I'm allowed to install, I can then install it. So it's a lot, uh, uh, the privileged elevation and delegation management side of the house is really about which local applications are users allowed to run and which of those are allowed to run with elevation. 
Zero trust is sort of the other side of the house, right? Uh, we, we've all sort of heard the buzzword over the years, assume breach, uh, verify users, verify context. And we do a lot of that, right? We do that with MFA in different places. We do that with uh, access requests. We do that with workflow. And this is sort of the same kind of view, right? Um, is what you'll see is how complicated corporate networks have become, right? So one solution in one particular cloud will often not cover everything you need. Most, most corporations still have a data center. They still have on-prem. Most of the people I'm talking to are still syncing from their on-premise Active Directory up to their Azure Active Directory. And so the, one of the challenges become, how do we handle all these different things in all these different places? So um, you, you, you'll start to see that different accounts are, are used to access different kinds of data in different places. And we wanna control all that. We wanna bring that all back uh, to one system to control that. Then another way to think about it really is authentication versus authorization, right? So authentication, let's verify who you are. Let's make sure you say who you are. Let's verify where you're coming from. And authorization is what you're authorized to do, right? So a user comes in, they will authenticate, and then they will be given an authorization. Really important to understand the difference between the two of them, because it's gonna help you understand elevation of programs. We often refer to it as the two sides of the PAM coin. So Gartner really breaks it down, thanks Gartner, into these, uh, these, these two different uh, acronyms. PASM, Privileged Account Session Management, that's the vaulting. That's our secret server where you're going to be able to go in. It's going to go out and it's going to find these secrets. It's going to store them for you. It's going to be able to rotate their passwords on a schedule. And it's going to be able to start sessions for you where you click a button, it opens an RDP session, uh, proxies you all the way through to the inbox seamlessly. And then the other side of the house, that's that Pedum side of the house. Um, where you're really talking about, hey, how do I elevate applications on a, a local endpoint? And that's going to be something like our privilege manager side of the house, where we're going to look at applications being run. We're going to be able to take a look and see, hey, maybe who signed the code before we decide if we want to allow that application to run or allow that application to be elevated. And single sign-on and multi-factor are super important, right? Uh, in both cases, right? So to, before you get into the PASM uh, system, we're gonna want you to prove who you are. You can do that either via a multi-factor. I would say two years ago, maybe last year still, I was helping people set up multi-factor a lot. And this year there's been a big swing over towards single sign-on. And I think that might be because people are starting to sync their, their Active Directory up to Azure and it's a lot easier to do single sign-on. So we support any SAML provider. So we're gonna verify who people are before we trust them um, with that sort of elevated access. And part of what this is gonna do is it's gonna prevent ransomware. The way that it's gonna prevent ransomware is it's not gonna allow applications to run on endpoints unless we verified what the application is. So one thing that we do is we, we have a policy that you can put on your endpoint that the agents will verify that code is signed before you allow it to run. And that's a really, really good way to just stop dead in your tracks and get rid of a lot of that garbage code that gets downloaded. You can also take away the local admin rights from users so they can't install any new applications and any new applications that are gonna be installed have to come through some sort of approval process. Zero trust is the other big thing, and that's really where we get into that sort of MFA, right? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna layer MFA at different points. We're gonna allow people to access a network via a web browser, and we're gonna allow people to do just-in-time elevation. So um, we're not gonna leave admin accounts with standing privileges, we're going to add the, you know, maybe domain admin group to them while they're being used 
and then we're going to yank it back away. We're not going to leave those domain admins sitting in Active Directory not being used. And another big point here is that people often use a PAM solution like ours to narrow their footprint, right? So they'll get away from having so many domain admins and they'll have a few domain admins uh, and they'll let people check out those domain admins when they need them. And the idea behind that is you're trying to lessen your, your risk footprint. You're really gonna monitor who comes in, who can access these really top level accounts uh, and, you, and you're gonna watch them much more like a hawk. And then of course, we're gonna audit everything. We're going to record RDP sessions. We're gonna record SSH sessions. We're gonna capture the keystrokes. We're really gonna monitor everything everybody does because that is a big part of zero trust so that we can go back and we can find out exactly who was doing what. And we can layer that MFA. That MFA is not just one time. That MFA can come at different points, right? So we can have people do an MFA at the vault login, and then they can come and they could try to check out a credential. At that point, we can MFA them again, right? Um, and, 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 and really, one of the big things you have to do is you have to think about how many times you're trying to layer MFA on people. One of the things we can do is, is we do have timeouts. So you can say, okay, MFA this person, don't MFA them again for the next 30 minutes. You can MFA at session in, in, initialization, initiation, sorry. And you can MFA at privileged elevation. So there's different points where you can layer on the zero trust approach to verify that the users are who they say they are before you're going to trust them with further elevated rights. And, and, and that's uh, baked into the DNA uh, of the company, right? We, we really want to be able to do all those checks at different places. And then if, if you look at MFA, uh, or sorry, if you look at zero trust, really uh, it's going to fit a schema like this, right? We decide who we're going to trust. Then we verify who they are. You know, is Bob Bob? Does Bob have Bob's cell phone? Is Bob dialing in from a, an IP address in the United States? That sort of thing, you know? Then we're going to contextualize what they're trying to do, right? Maybe it's a checkout of a credential. Bob needs to use the domain admin credential for a period of time. Let's give him that credential, but let's time box it. Let's go ahead and secure the admin environment that they're in. And then let's grant them the amount of privilege that they need to do to do the action. And audit everything. MFA everywhere, audit everything. That's really what it comes down to. And really is what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify risk and lessen risk around your network. And that comes from a lot of places, a lot of new places to a lot of us, right? So DevOps, uh, which is all about automate everything and automation everywhere. We wanna be able to plug into those DevOps tools. We really wanna be able to play in the DevSecOps field. We want uh, the DevOps tools to have to request back to the same place that a human would. So we can verify that they used a credential, we know who used it, and we know that they came and checked it out from a particular place. That's where we're gonna be able to plug into those different pipelines, whether it's an Azure DevOps pipeline or, or Terraform or Jenkins, something along those lines. Cloud credentials is a big one I've been running into a lot lately. So I'm a sales engineer. I talk to people with everyday problems. One of the biggest one I've been running into lately is uh, AWS IM keys. People have a real sprawl of AWS IM keys. They need to know, how do I get a handle on those? How do I verify who's using them? How do I go ahead and rotate them, right? And then make people come and grab whatever the current credential is so that they, I know that they didn't just write it down, that they came and, and grabbed the credential. That's where uh, a vaulting process like ours is able to do that. And then APIs, right? We're really big on APIs. We have a very, a very strong API. Um, we, if, if you want to try to get to a passwordless state, we've got the ability to make trusted servers um, and, and sort of a lot of different things. We, we do have a lot of DR strategies. I see that appears to be a, some of the topics coming through in the questions. Um, there's different ways to cache break glass credentials. 
So uh, we have the ability to cache a break glass credential um, over in another cloud. We have the ability to uh, cache a break glass credential uh, on a mobile app. Uh, there's multiple ways to make it so that if your cloud connection goes down, you're still able to keep working. Because it's what we're not trying to do is stop people from working. We're trying to make it seamless for them to work. You know, and this goes back to that, that same sort of thing of, of who's going to access which data, right? And one of the big ones we run into is contractors, third parties. How do I make it so that my contractors are under control? One way we can do that is we can put a checkout uh, around a uh, particular credential. So the contractor comes in, they have to check out the credential. They may have to be approved. We may hit a ticket system via API and verify that there's an open ticket. Once we do, we'll give that credential to that contractor. We'll probably hide the password from them if we can, create a launcher for them to use that credential, and we'll time box it. So whenever the time that they're allowed to have the credential is up, we'll close the session so they're no longer able to, to use the uh, RDP or SSH session. We'll close that automatically. And then at that point, we'll go ahead and rotate that password. We'll just create a brand new password. Then when that contractor walks away, there's no chance of them walking away with the password because our system has just changed it on the back end. You know, um, as Delinea, we are heritage psychotic and heritage centrify, and we bring together a lot of those different things, right? So we have the vaulting, which really is our secret server, and then our connection manager that lets you use those credentials outside of secret server. So if you need to open 12 RDP sessions in different tabs, we have a product that can do that. It can record all those sessions. Uh, it can proxy all those sessions over our server to really create session isolation. And then over there at the Elevate side of the house, a lot of that comes from the Centrify side of the house. Things like server suite to help determine which applications are allowed to be run and be elevated on servers or privilege manager, which is our really least privilege endpoint protection product. You're gonna be able to take away local admin rights from your users and still allow them to elevate applications as needed. And then we have a number of, of ancillary products around that. We have a account lifecycle manager, which is a workflow around the creation and deletion of service accounts. So is what we notice a lot of places is there's real service account sprawl. Service accounts get created. Service accounts often have uh, very high privileges because people will provision them in order to make something work. Um, and then no one ever gets rid of them. You know, maybe someone's doing a, a, a POC of my product. They have to create a service account for that. You know, does someone actually delete that service account at the end of its life cycle, right? And that's what account lifecycle manager is all about. It gives an owner to the service account. It imports the service account into secret server so that we can change the password on it. And then it has an end of life action and an owner. Let's go ahead and delete that service account after you know, 360 days or something. And then our programmatic access, which runs through our DSV or DevOps secrets vault. You know, Pam should be a priority, right? People shouldn't be creating their own passwords anymore. Passwords should be automatically generated uh, for, for, for corporate systems. At home, I hope you use a password manager. Uh, most of us do. Um, but, you know, really we want to randomize those passwords. We don't want dictionary words in them. We want to create a 25 character random password. We want to vault that. We want to hide it from the end user. Uh, and we want to be able to change it uh, at will. A little bit of corporate information. And it looked like someone asked me if I could just jump into a quick demo, which I hadn't expected to do, but I can do that real quick for you. I do have my demo system up on this box. Let me just jump over to this other machine here real quick. And I'll try to show you sort of basically what it looks like in a very, very quick fashion. So this is a VM that I have running and I'm running uh, our vault which is secret server. Secret server, um, once again, it's the practicing least privilege. Users will get synced in from somewhere. They'll use their lesser privileged account. 
they'll be able to come in and get access to their more privileged account. Whenever I want to use my Brett Jones admin account, I come in here, I click on it, I'm forced to check it out. I'm now the only one who can use it for a period of time. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm going to use it, I'm going to go ahead and do something like start an RDP session. I don't know the password. The password's been hidden from me. This session is going to be proxied over my secret server, and it's going to be recorded, including capturing all the keystrokes that I issue in the session. So the way that we do this to get session isolation is we actually start one RDP session between myself and my secret server and a second one to the end box. So we're actually man in the middle between two RDP sessions. I'm going to be able to use this account. Whenever I'm done with it, I can check it back in. Super simple. That's a trigger point for us. We will trigger a password change, in this case, in Active Directory at that point. So and this is really the pan vaulting. This is our secret server product. Uh, it's really the basis of what we do. Whenever we're looking at Windows service accounts, is what we'll do is we'll go out and we'll find all the places across the network that those service accounts are being used. Then when it comes time for us to automatically change the password on a particular account, we already have a listing of where it's being used across the network. We reach out and we update the password on all those endpoints. So go out, hit Active Directory, create a new password, boom, 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 spider across the network, update the password on the services, on the endpoints, you know, restart the services if needed. And you can really see that happen really easily. Passwords changed, randomized password created, connect to all the different boxes and update the password on all the different services. And that's, that, that's really sort of the basics of what Secret Server does. It's able to import all those things and then give people the chance to use them securely. 